All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you in God's house today as we gather for worship. We welcome you to this service today on this uh, not quite as cold day, um, even though there is still snow on the ground in Louisiana on day number six. Imagine that. Um, but we are glad to see you in God's house today. Uh, we also want to welcome all those who will be watching us online at a later point. And so we, uh, we pray that this will be a time that will grow and help your faith as we seek to grow closer to Jesus Christ. Let's see, I have a few announcements to mention to you this morning. We are planning on resuming, God willing and weather willing, a, um, a normal week this week. Um, notice that our Wednesday schedule has changed a little bit for the season of Lent. We will have supper at 5 o'clock, small groups at 5.30, and then special Lenten activities in the gym following at 6.30 will be done about 7 o'clock so that we can get home, get everybody home in plenty of time. We know that it is a school night. So that we would invite you to join us for that. Um, and I know that as much as we hated to, we had to cancel our Ash Wednesday service this past week. Um, I do have ashes this morning. Our discipline is clear that ashes is optional for us. Ashes are optional for us as United Methodists. That what is much more important than what we do on the outside is what God is doing on the inside. But if it would not be lent for you without receiving ashes, I do have ashes if you would like to receive them after the service is over. I'll be glad to go through the liturgy and to offer ashes to you if you would like to do so. So um, we are hoping to resume a normal week and to open the office tomorrow. And um, so, so please um, continue to pray for us as we try to catch up from a week that was lost to snow and ice and all other kinds of challenges. Okay, any other announcements that we need to mention this morning? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, United Methodist Women will meet on uh, Tuesday at 9.30 in the, probably the fellowship hall. So, okay. everybody's welcome. <laughs> Tuesday at 9.30 for the Methodist Women. Also, you have probably noticed that there are a couple of changes to the sanctuary. Um, the, our, the Lenten series is called At the Cross, and each week we will be focusing on an object that um, reminds us of Jesus' time and journey to the cross, and we'll be leaving it at the cross. And so the cross has been placed here in the sanctuary for the duration of Lent. And we also have um, a Lenten candle liturgy, which is kind of the opposite of Advent candles, and um, I'll be talking more about that later in the service. And so we have a couple of special things that we're doing for Lent. Anything else this morning? All right, then I invite you to hear this call to worship from Psalm chapter 25. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Would you join with me in our opening prayer? Everlasting God. Because of your tender mercy toward all people, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, that all should follow the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may be partakers of his resurrection through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning, and please bear with us that um, Jenny is 
Uh, Jay Copen is filling in on a last minute basis. And so we're going to give her some grace and she's going to give us some grace as we worship together today. Our opening hymn is Lord Who Throughout These 40 Days, number 269. And Jenny, let's sing the odd verses, 1, 3, and 5. Would you please stand as we sing together? forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. and you will receive a link via text that will take you directly to that online giving page. It is uh, unusual and difficult times uh, that after a hurricane in the summer and now the winter weather, this winter it seems um, uh, particularly difficult to be doing ministry and work and we couldn't do it without your support and we are so grateful uh, for all that you do to support the work of your church. So thank you in advance for your gifts. And now I want to remind you of the names that are listed on the back of your bulletin. Now this is um, several weeks old because um, Darlene was not able to get here at all this week. So uh, this is from, I believe, the February 7th bulletin. So it might be uh, a little bit out of date. 
Uh, of course, we still have many that we need to pray for that have been impacted and affected by the storm. I saw a utility truck on 84 as I was coming in from Cooley, so I know that everybody's kind of in a different place uh, with this, that there are some that are struggling with water, some are struggling with electricity, some struggling just to get back to normal, so we want to continue to pray for so many affected by the storm. There are several congregations in our conference who received damage uh, from broken pipes and uh, other other things with the storm, so we also want to remember them. I did talk to um, Tammy Hyatt this week, and um, she is has been in the hospital here in town um, and is going to go to Alexandria this week to schedule and hopefully perform her next procedure, and then we'll be in recovery from that. So, so please continue to pray for her. Um, so. Um, I know many of you know that Jenna was trying to get to Northwest Arkansas uh, last week to see uh, Ann Booth. We, she never got there, but Ann is home from the hospital and seems to be doing much better. So we are grateful for your prayers for her. So those are some of the names that are before you and some of the folks that are on our hearts and minds. Do you have others that you'd like to share today? Yes, uh, we need to pray for Johnny Lutz. He had a heart attack last time. The tiny boots. The family of Kenny Blundell. The family of Kenny Blundell. Uh, Jackie Gaddis. They had to try to get her back in the end. She got cut. Oh, goodness. Jackie Gaddis. The family of Tom Trailer. Yes. Congregation of Atlanta Baptist Church. Yes. From what I understand, Missy Smith is doing well, and um, the only thing that prevented her from coming back home is the weather. So we are grateful for her improvement. There's still people without power in town this morning. Yes. Yes. But yeah. we're thankful for the utility workers that got everybody back up. Yeah, the guys that got us back up were from Tallahassee, Florida. So we're grateful for so many people that have come from all over to help help us and help others affected by um, the storm. Okay, others this morning. All right, then let us join together in prayer. Oh Lord, we are so grateful for your presence with us. The Lord, no matter what storm we are facing, if it is a physical one like a hurricane or a winter storm, or maybe it's something at work or at school, or maybe it's something in our lives with friends and family, Lord, we know that you are with us that you know what it is like to face challenges because you sent Jesus, your only son, to the cross for us. And so as we begin this message series at the cross and as we think about what it truly cost Jesus to go to the cross and to die for our sins and to be resurrected, Lord, we pray that you would draw us near to you and to one another as we walk with Jesus. And so, Lord, as we hear this passage from Luke, as Jesus begins his journey to the cross, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to what you're trying to say to us, to walk with you, to draw close to you, and to walk with Jesus on this, this um, journey each and every day. Lord, uh, as we are here in your house, Lord, maybe as we watch online, Lord, we know that there are many that are in need of our prayers. There are so many that have been impacted by the storm. Churches who have flooded due to burst pipes. People that are still without electricity or without water or face so many different challenges that our way of life has been um, set aside because of the snow and the ice. But Lord, we, uh, we know that you are still with us that you are still God, and so we look to you for help and hope each and every day. 
Lord, we continue to pray for so many that are ill, maybe recovering from surgery, maybe facing surgery. Lord, we also remember so many that are still dealing with the virus and are in need of your healing touch. Lord, we also continue to pray for so many that have lost a loved one to death. We have mentioned several this morning, and we pray for those families that your comfort and peace would be with them. Lord, whatever challenges we face, be it a winter storm, be it work or school, friends or family, Lord, we know that you are with us, that you have promised to never leave us or forsake us. And it is all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, today we are going to begin a message, a series of messages that I'm calling At the Cross. And each week we are going to focus on an object that draws our attention to the cross. Now, I want to give sort of a Surgeon General's warning, so to speak, that these messages are a little different than what you typically hear from me. That instead of having several defined points within the message, that it's more of a reflection on that one object. And so just know that um, when you... When you hear my message this morning and you think it's a little different than usual, then yes, it is a little different than what I usually bring. So our scripture reading today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. And so I invite you to hear the word of the Lord today. When the days drew near for him, Jesus, to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. One of my favorite Christian classics is this little book, written by John Bunyan called Pilgrim's Progress. And one of the amazing things about this book is that it was written largely from jail. The author being in prison for holding religious services outside of the auspices of the Church of England. By 1692, 100,000 copies of this book had been sold. Every English household that owned a Bible also owned this famous allegorical book. Eventually, it became the best-selling book apart from the Bible in publishing history. If you have not read it, I would invite you to consider doing so. You can read an electronic copy for free on your Kindle or other device. You can check it out from many libraries. You can order your own copy for less than $5, or you can even borrow mine if you get truly desperate. By the way, if you're not a reader, you can also find a video version, several video versions of this book for free on YouTube. Or if you have Amazon Prime Video, there are several versions on there also. And several of them are animated so that they are kid friendly. So I'd like for you to consider reading or watching, learning more about The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Now, it is the story of a man on a journey, a man named Christian, making his way from the city of destruction to the celestial city. Along the way, he has many mountains and valleys, temptations and blessings, helpers and tempters. But with the help and the encouragement of others, Christian finally does remain on the journey and makes it to his final destination 
of the celestial city. Like Christian, we are all on a journey, a journey that we often call life. Many of you know that Jana and I love to travel. We have been fortunate and blessed to travel to many places, including Alaska and Israel, Rome, Yellowstone, Mexico, New York City, and many others. Yes, there are still places that we want to visit and we hope to do so in the future. But like almost everyone else, we have been stuck close to home because of the pandemic. And if that wasn't enough, we have been stuck in our homes this week because our roads were more suited for ice skates than vehicles. It's a crazy world out there. Thank God, God is here to help us. But when we travel, we have a destination in mind. We don't just wander aimlessly, at least I hope not, otherwise we will not get very far. So it was for Jesus, that Jesus was on a journey. His destination was the cross and then the empty tomb. And so beginning today and over the next weeks of Lent, we will be focusing on some objects that played a part in Jesus' journey to the cross. And we will be leaving the objects on the cross as a reminder of Jesus' journey and as an invitation to walk with him on the way to the cross. Today's object is a map. Specifically, it is a map of Israel in Jesus' time, and we'll talk more about it a little bit later. And so let us walk with Jesus on his journey to the cross. Now in Luke chapter 9, Jesus is just coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And that glorious meeting with Moses, Elijah, and God, which Luke places earlier in his chapter. After the transfiguration and after coming down off of the mountain, Luke reports that Jesus cast out a demon and then rebukes the disciples who are arguing among themselves about who was the greatest. And so we come to verses 51 through 56, where Jesus makes a resolute decision to go to Jerusalem and to accept all that awaits him there. Jesus made a decision to accept the journey to the cross. My personal opinion is that he made it of his own free will, that he took it up for us, that he could have said no as easily as he said yes. In the original language, the word journey is used four times in these five verses. This is obviously important to the story. Jesus is going somewhere. He is not a drifter. He is not a vagrant. He is not a wanderer. He is on a journey with a specific destination in mind. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines journey as something su suggesting travel or passage from one place to another. Jesus has a plan, a goal, a destination in mind that he has set his face toward Jerusalem. That plan includes Jerusalem and all that awaits him there, including the cross. The text twice says that Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. Obviously, it's something that Luke wants us to pay attention to. It's one of those times that I wish I had been there, that I wish I had been able to see the expression on Jesus' face. I wish I could have seen it for myself. That words can only describe it so much that I can almost imagine Jesus turning toward Jerusalem with a resolute look in his eyes, with determination in his step, a seriousness in his demeanor as he turns to the disciples and says, we are going to Jerusalem. He is determined. He will not be denied. He knows he has an appointment to keep in Jerusalem. And I can't help but wonder what he felt. Maybe excitement, maybe apprehension, wonder about was what was to come, maybe even questions. Now there has been much debate among scholars as to how much of the future that Jesus could see, especially since the Bible is clear that Jesus is both human and divine at the same time. 
Even if Jesus did not know that the cross awaited him in Jerusalem, it does seem that he knew that something special, something important awaited him there. And it seems like he knew that it would not be an easy thing because he set his face to go there. He was had to be determined. He knew that was his destination and he set his face toward Jerusalem. Now, my personal theory with nothing to really prove it is that the Passion Week and the culmination of Jesus's purpose on earth was a part of the conversation that Jesus had on top of the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah and God. And so here by Luke 9, 51 through 56, he is determined to go to Jerusalem and meet whatever fate awaits him there. But nine chapters later, by the time we get to Luke 18, verses 31 through 34, Jesus knows exactly what he is facing, that he tells his disciples that soon he will be arrested, that he will be crucified and then raised again. And his, he pulls the disciples aside to share that important information with them. But even knowing what is in front of him, Jesus continues on his journey to the cross. I can't help but wonder if Jesus ever thought about quitting. Maybe asking God if it would be okay if maybe they didn't go to Jerusalem this year for Passover. I've got to admit that there are some days when I've felt like quitting. When in those days when it seems like you've not only made no progress towards your goal, but maybe even gone backwards, that it seems like you are farther away from your goals than you were when the day started. I've got to admit that if I were Jesus, I probably would have said, me? You want me to go where? To the cross? I think I'll pass on that invitation. Imagine the courage, the determination, the gumption, I don't know if anyone uses gumption anymore, but that was kind of the best word that I could think of. The, the determination for Jesus to go to the cross, the courage and fortitude it must have taken. The truth is, I imagine that few of us would be willing to do it. But Jesus remained faithful to the journey that God had for him despite the obstacles. And I couldn't help but think about the times that I have strayed or wandered or wavered from what God had called me to do because it would be too hard or distasteful or it might make someone angry or hurt someone. Yet Jesus remained faithful to God and he set his face toward Jerusalem. And so we should also seek to be faithful to God. Now, after this, the next chapters are all about what happens on Jesus's journey to the city. Once he sets his face toward Jerusalem, there is no turning back. And, and Jesus knew that, that had an idea of what would be facing him. Everything that the gospels tell us in these next chapters must be looked at through the lens of one of those great countdown clocks. I was watching a basketball game yesterday and it's kind of like that, that you start with so many minutes and you click down until the end when finally there are zeros on the clock. The clock is now ticking for Jesus and every moment counts. And what is the very first thing that they run into on the beginning of their journey. Rejection. That Jesus sends two of his disciples on ahead of them to make preparations to spend a night in a Samaritan village. Can you imagine James and John and they go and they knock on the door of someone's home in the Samaritan's village and they say, hey, we're on our way to Jerusalem. May we spend the night at your house? And instead of opening the door, the door is shut in their face. And we wonder, why would this happen? Why would someone be so rude in a day when there are no hotels, in a day when there are no bed and breakfast? Why would someone turn another away? Well, you see, there was an age old battle between the Jews and the Samaritans. You might remember that the Samaritans were descended from Jews who were left behind in the Holy Land when the rest of the Jews were 
taken into exile into Babylon. And those Jews left behind, they intermarried with Gentiles and they became Samaritans. They were seen by the Jews who returned home from exile as at very best half-breeds. At the worst, they were seen as enemies. The Jews hated the Samaritans so much that they would often journey out of their way to avoid their region altogether, hence the map. Now, I know you probably can't see this, but Jesus was lived much of his life up here in the north part of Israel near Nazareth. He did much of his ministry in places like Capernaum and Cana and Tiberias. And so he was up here in the north quite a bit. But Jerusalem is down here in the south. In between is the region of Samaria. In fact, a lot of the Jews that lived up here in Galilee, they hated the Samaritans so much that they would cross the Jordan River and they would go down the east side to get to Jerusalem and thereby avo avoided their region altogether. You know how it is when we were growing up and I grew up in, in Baton Rouge in a big city and, and, and sometimes folks would tell me, you don't want to go to that part of the city. That's how it was for Samaritans, that the, the Jews would tell their children and they would stay away. They would say, that's a place that you don't want to go. And so some of the Samaritans, apparently this village at least, had determined to do everything they could to hinder the Jews passing through their territory. Now, it's interesting to me that Jesus decides to go through Samaria, right? He could have gone around like many of the other Jews, but he decides to go through that region. But this village decides to close their doors to travelers, something almost unheard of in that day when finding a place of shelter could literally be life and death. The village decides to reject Jesus rather than welcome him. Still today, there are those who reject Jesus. Maybe they doubt that he is real. Maybe they doubt that Jesus can make a difference in their lives. Maybe they are afraid of how following Jesus might change them or what Jesus might ask them to leave behind or take up. There will always be those who reject Jesus. This is nothing new. We see, we see it here in Luke. Jesus knew what it was like. To be rejected and I don't know but I can only imagine what might have happened if this village had received him maybe he would have healed the sick Jesus did that on many occasions maybe he would have cast out demons Jesus did that maybe he would have taught them Jesus taught many times maybe he would have even raised Someone from the dead, he did that on a couple of occasions too. But we'll never know. Because instead of opening their arms and welcoming Jesus, they turned him away. You see, following Jesus is never easy and it is often scary. But I can only imagine the blessings, the miracles that they might have missed because they turned Jesus away. May we not do that. May we not miss the blessings and the miracles and the wonders by rejecting Jesus and refusing to follow him. So may we learn from this Samaritan village and may we welcome Jesus into our homes and into our lives. I love the response from James and John. They go back to Jesus and they tell him, hey, they closed their doors to us. They said, don't come here. How dare those Samaritans? And so James and John suggest that Jesus send down, oh, just a little fire and brimstone their way to consume the city as punishment for not welcoming them. No wonder these two were known as the sons of thunder. But Jesus would not do that, that he avoids the temptation to use violence. Instead, he wants to teach the disciples that one wrong does not entitle one to do harm to another. Two wrongs don't make a right. And so instead, they simply journey to another village. 
that Jesus was flexible. He had no trouble switching from plan A to plan B in order to reach his final destination. He took another approach to reaching his goal, not allowing the obstacles that were set in front of him to prevent him from getting where he needed to go. So it must be for us that our plans must be flexible, submitted to God's will and work and allow him to work in us. Jesus accepts his journey to the cross and he adopts it as his own. There's a portion of this Pilgrim's Progress book that I want to read to you, and it's a, quite a lengthy book, but I'm going to read just a couple of paragraphs to you. This is what it says. Now I could see in my dream that the highway Christian was to travel on was protected on either side by a wall, and the wall was called salvation. Burdened, Christian began to run up the highway but not without great difficulty because of the load that he was carrying on his back. He ran this way until he came to a place on somewhat higher ground where there stood a cross. A little way down from there was an open grace. And I saw in my dream that just as Christian approached the cross, his burden came loose from his shoulders, fell from his back, and began to roll downward until it tumbled into the open grace to be seen no more. Maybe you have burdens and worries and troubles. Maybe you should approach the cross and leave them there. Maybe that is your journey, your pilgrim's progress. Jesus also knew that his journey would not be an easy one, that there would be trouble as well as good times on the way. And yet Jesus remained faithful on his journey to the cross, even though he knew what was in front of him. So the question for us is, how serious are we about our journey? Are we willing to follow Jesus all the way, even to the cross? This Lenten journey will take us to meet people and signs and symbols that I hope will help us to realize the seriousness and the cost of Jesus's journey to the cross. After all, this was not a trip to the beach or a vacation, but a trip that would end in humiliation, rejection, torture and death before finally culminating in the resurrection. So today we place this map on the cross to remind us of Jesus's journey and as an invitation for us to step in line and to walk with him and to experience the journey with him this Lent. Will you come along? I doubt it will be an easy journey. Maybe we'll wonder if it's worth all of this hard work Maybe we'll think about quitting. Maybe we'll wonder if there's not some shortcut that we missed somewhere along the way. Maybe we'll meet those along the way who will reject us and will want to call down fire upon them. But then we will realize that in order to celebrate Easter and the resurrection, the cross was a necessity. That is the only way to get through, get to Easter is through the cross. And so I hope that you will join us on this journey to the cross for services each Sunday morning and also take a journey to the cross in your personal life, being honest with God about your fears, your failures, your need for him, so that you may also experience Easter resurrection and new life. The journey to the cross is before you, before me, will we Take up the journey. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we are so grateful for Jesus who was willing to take on a journey that we know led to a place that was full of pain and suffering and trials before it finally ended in triumph and resurrection. Lord, we know that our journey in life can be a difficult one. It has been a difficult week for many. But Lord, we are so grateful that you are with us along the way. We pray that you would help us to be there for Jesus, to walk with him. Lord, forgive us when we reject Jesus. Forgive those who, who, who reject him and who don't accept him. Lord, may they see all that Jesus has done for them and through them and to them. Lord, we pray 
that you would help us to have forgiveness for those who reject Jesus, not to call down fire upon them, but Lord, to simply be flexible and to, to make a different plan. Lord, we ask that you would lead us and guide us as we go through this journey, beginning today and throughout all of Lent. And it is all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, I told you I would tell you about the candles a little bit later in the service. These are Lenten candles, and I found a liturgy and meditation that we're going to use part of each week. And um, unlike the Advent candles that grow brighter as the season of Advent progresses, these candles will grow darker, that as we approach Good Friday and the cross, that a candle will be extinguished each week as we approach that dark day in Jesus's life. Now, I'm going to offer you a brief meditation um, and then give you a moment of silence and then invite you to, to, um, to join with me as we extinguish these Lenten candles. So hear this meditation. We have come together this morning for renewal in worship and personally and as a community of faith. But now the time of reflection and stillness is upon us. It is the first Sunday in Lent, the season for journeys of the heart. Close your eyes. Be still. Listen. We are entering a holy time. The Lenten candles have been lit, have been lit but over the next six weeks, the light will slowly fade into darkness. For we are retelling the story of Jesus' betrayal and suffering and death. We do not do this to be morbid, but because in the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, God is revealed in the amazing transformation of death into life, in endings transformed into beginnings, and in dead ends that become a source for new possibilities. This is the sacred center of our faith, the truth made manifest in Jesus Christ, that God is in each and every one of us, quietly transforming us and the world. In his pain and suffering, Jesus speaks to every pain and loss you have endured and offers you the promise of transformation. It is an old story, but it still has the power to reveal, to heal, and to redeem. Jesus is at the heart of our faith, in the depth of our souls. He is waiting for us, inviting us to leave ordinary time and follow along with him on the journey that brought him to the cross. Listen in silence, for Jesus is calling you. As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain of injustice in the world. Would you pray with me? It's found in your bulletin. Loving God, as we journey through this holy season of Lent, Give us strength and courage to make the changes that are needed in our lives. Open our hearts and minds to your steadfast presence and help us to put our trust in you. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Number 159, Lift High the Cross. We'll sing the first and the last verse, and we'll be singing cross hymns 
each and every Sunday in Lent as we journey to the cross with Jesus. Would you stand as we sing number 159, the first and the last verse, Lift High the Cross. did most of the work but my invitation to you is to take a cross and it's a small it's designed to fit in your hand It's often called the clinging cross that you can cling to and hold to pick one up and to to literally carry your cross every day throughout Lent gentlemen maybe you want to put it in your pocket to where when you go in and reach for your keys you remember that you are carrying the cross of Jesus. Ladies, maybe you want to put it in your purse so that you carry it with you wherever you go. Maybe you want to take it to school if you're a young person. But my invitation for you is to pick up one of these crosses and to literally carry your cross through Lent to remember what Jesus has done for us through his life, death, and resurrection. I hope that you will pick one up as you leave. I Hope I have enough. I think I have enough. If not, uh, we will have more available next week. And to literally carry your cross as we think about what the cross means and what it means for us during Lent. And so pick that up on your way out and now hear this benediction. Oh Lord, we are so grateful for Jesus, for his determination to go to Jerusalem and to face whatever happened to him there. Lord, we pray that we would also be determined to follow Jesus each and every day, that we would join with him on his journey to the cross, that as we carry our crosses, that we would be reminded of the cross that he carried for us. And so, Lord, we pray that you, for those who reject Jesus, that they would come to know him as Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray for us when we are frustrated and we want to call down fire on those with whom we disagree. Instead, Lord, we pray that you would help us to simply take another route. Lord, as we hear from Jesus and from your holy word, we pray that you would help us to learn from him as we follow him each and every day. And it is all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Please remember to pick up your cross on the way out. <laughs>